Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, we bring you The Interlopers, Gabriel Ernest, and The Open Window by H. H. Monroe. Hugo Hector Monroe, better known by the pen name Saki, was a British writer whose witty, mischievous, and sometimes macabre stories satirized Edwardian society and culture. He is often compared to O. Henry and Dorothy Parker. Influenced by Oscar Wilde, Lewis Carroll, and Rudyard Kipling, he himself influenced A. A. Milne and Noel Coward. The pen name Saki is most commonly assumed to be a reference to the cup-bearer in the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. However, Saki may also be a reference to the South American monkey of that name. Either way, it's a cool pen name. And now, The Interlopers by H. H. Munro. In a forest of mixed growth somewhere on the eastern spurs of the Carpathians, a man stood one winter night watching and listening, as though he waited for some beast of the woods to come within the range of his vision and later of his rifle. But the game for whose presence he kept so keen an outlook was none that figured in the sportsman's calendar as lawful or proper for the chase. Ulrich von Gradwich patrolled the dark forest in quest of a human enemy. The forest lands of Gradwich were of wide extent and well stocked with game. The narrow strip of precipitous woodland that lay on its outskirt was not remarkable for the game it harbored or the shooting it afforded, but it was the most jealously guarded of all its owner's territorial possessions. A famous lawsuit in the days of his grandfather had wrested it from the illegal possession of a neighboring family of petty landowners. The dispossessed party had never acquiesced in the judgment of the courts, and a long series of poaching affrays and similar scandals had embittered the relationship between the families for three generations. The neighbor feud had grown into a personal one since Ulrich had come to be head of his family. If there was a man in the world whom he detested and wished ill to— it was George Zenum, the inheritor of the quarrel, and the tireless game-snatcher and raider of the disputed border forest. The feud might perhaps have died down or been compromised if the personal ill-will of the two men had not stood in the way. As boys they had thirsted for one another's blood, as men each prayed that misfortune might fall on the other, and this wind-scourged winter night Aldrich had banded together his foresters to watch the dark forest— not in quest of four-footed quarry, but to keep a lookout for the prowling thieves whom he suspected of being afoot from across the land boundary. The roebuck, which usually kept in the sheltering hollows during a storm wind, were running like driven things tonight, and there was movement and unrest among the creatures that were wont to sleep through the dark hours. Assured there was a disturbing element in the forest, Ulrich could guess the quarter from whence it came." He strayed away by himself from the watchers, whom he had placed in ambush on the crest of the hill, and wandered far down the steep slopes amid the wild tangle of undergrowth, peering through the tree trunks, and listening through the whistling and skirling of the wind, and the restless beating of the branches, for sight and sound of the marauders. If only on this wild night, in this dark, lone spot, he might come across George Zeman, Man to man, with none to witness, that was the wish that was uppermost in his thoughts, and as he stepped around the trunk of a huge beech, he came face to face with the man he sought. The two enemies stood glaring at one another for a long, silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand, each had hate in his heart, and murder upmost in his mind. The chance had come to give full play to the passions of a lifetime— but a man who has been brought up under the code of a restraining civilization cannot easily nerve himself to shoot down his neighbor in cold blood and without word spoken, except for an offense against his hearth and honor. And before the moment of hesitation had given way to action, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A fierce shriek of the storm had been answered by a splitting crash over their heads, and ere they could leap aside, a mass of falling beech tree had thundered down on them. 
Aldrich van Goodrich found himself stretched on the ground, one arm numb beneath him and the other held almost as helpless in a tight tangle of forked branches, while both legs were pinned beneath the fallen mass. His heavy shooting boots had saved his feet from being crushed to pieces, but if his fractures were not as serious as they might have been, at least it was evidence that he could not move from his present position till someone came to release him. The descending twig has slashed the skin of his face, and he had to wink away some drops of blood from his eyelashes before he could take in a general view of the disaster. At his side, so near that under ordinary circumstances he could almost have touched him, lay George Zeman, alive and struggling, but obviously as helplessly pinioned down as himself. All around them lay a thick, strewn wreckage of splintered branches and broken twigs. Relief at being alive and exasperated at his captive plight brought a strange medley of pious thank-offerings and sharp curses to Ulrich's lips. George, who was already blinded with the blood which trickled across his eyes, stopped his struggling for a moment to listen, and then gave a short, snarling laugh. "'So you're not killed, as you ought to be, but you're caught, anyway,' he cried. "'Caught fast! Oh, what a jest! Ulrich von Gradwich snared in his stolen forest!' "'That's real justice for you!' And he laughed again, mocking and savagely. "'I'm caught in my own forest land,' retorted Ulrich. "'When my men come to release us, "'you will wish, perhaps, that you were in a better plight "'than caught poaching on a neighbor's land. "'Shame on you!' George was silent for a moment. Then he answered quietly, "'Are you sure that your men will find much to release? "'I have men, too, in the forest tonight, close behind me.' And they will be here first and do the releasing. When they drag me out from under these damp branches, it wouldn't need much clumsiness on their part to roll this mass of trunk right over on top of you. Your men will find you dead under a fallen beech tree. For form's sake, I shall send my condolences to your family. It is a useful hint, said Ulrich fiercely. My men had orders to follow in ten minutes' time, Seven of which must have gone by already, and when they get me out, I'll remember the hint. Only as you will have met your death poaching on my lands, I don't think I can decently send any message of condolence to your family. Good, snarled George. Good. We fight this quarrel out to the death. You and I and our foresters, with no cursed interlopers to come between us. Death and damnation to you, Ulrich von Gradwich. The same to you, George Zeman, forest thief, game snatcher. Both men spoke with the bitterness of possible defeat before them, for each knew that it might be long before his men would seek him out or find him. It was a bare matter of chance which party would arrive first on the scene. Both had now given up the useless struggle to free themselves from the mass of wood that held them down. Ulrich limited his endeavors to an effort to bring his one partially freed arm near enough to his outer coat pocket to draw out his wine flask. Even when he had accomplished that operation, it was long before he could manage the unscrewing of the stopper or get any of the liquid down his throat. But what a heaven-sent draft it was! It was an open winter, and little snow had fallen yet, hence the captives suffered less from the cold than might have been the case at that season of the year. Nevertheless, the wine was warming and reviving to the wounded man, and he looked across with something like a throb of pity to where his enemy lay, just keeping the groans of pain and weariness from crossing his lips. "'Could you reach this flask if I threw it over to you?' asked Ulrich suddenly. There is good wine in it, and one may as well be as comfortable as one can. Let us drink, even if tonight one of us dies. No, I can scarcely see anything. There is so much blood caked around my eyes, said George. And in any case, I don't drink wine with an enemy. Ulrich was silent for a few minutes and lay listening to the weary screeching of the wind. An idea was slowly forming and growing in his brain, an idea that gained strength every time he looked across at the man who was fighting so grimly 
against pain and exhaustion. In the pain and languor that Ulrich himself was feeling, the old fierce hatred seemed to be dying down. Neighbor, he said presently, do as you please if your men come first. It was a fair compact. But as for me, I've changed my mind. If my men are the first to come, you shall be the first to be helped, as though you were my guest. We have quarreled like devils all our lives over this stupid strip of forest, where the trees can't even stand upright in a breath of wind. Lying here tonight, thinking, I've come to think we've been rather fools. There are better things in life than getting the better of a boundary dispute. Neighbor, if you will help me to bury the old quarrel, I... I will ask you to be my friend. George Zeman was silent for so long that Ulrich thought, perhaps, he had fainted with the pain of his injuries. Then he spoke slowly and in jerks. How the whole region would stare and gabble if we rode into the market square together. No one living can remember seeing a Zeman and a von Gradwitz talking to one another in friendship. And what peace there would be among the forest folk if we ended our feud tonight. And if we choose to make peace among our people, there is none other to interfere. No interlopers from outside. You would come and keep the Sylvester night beneath my roof, and I would come and feast on some high day at your castle. I would never fire a shot on your land, save when you invited me as a guest, and you should come and shoot with me down in the marshes where the wild fowl are. In all the countryside, there are none that could hinder if we willed to make peace. I never thought to have wanted to do other than hate you all my life, but I think I have changed my mind about things, too, this last half hour. And you offered me your wine flask. Ulrich von Gradwitz, I will be your friend. For a space, both men were silent, turning over in their minds the wonderful changes that this dramatic reconciliation would bring about. In the cold, gloomy forest, with the wind tearing in fitful gusts through the naked branches and whistling round the tree trunks, they lay and waited for the help that would now bring release and succor to both parties, and each prayed a private prayer that his men might be the first to arrive, so that he might be the first to show honorable attention to the enemy that had become a friend. Presently, as the wind dropped for a moment, Ulrich broke silence. Let's shout for help, he said. In this lull, our voices may carry a little. They won't carry far through the trees and undergrowth, said George. But we can try. Together, then. The two raised their voices in a prolonged hunting call. Together again, said Ulrich, a few minutes later, after listening in vain for an answering halloo. I heard nothing but the pestilential wind, said George hoarsely. There was a silence again for some minutes, and then Ulrich gave a joyful cry. I can see figures coming through the wood. They are following in the way I came down the hillside. Both men raised their voices in as loud a shout as they could muster. They hear us. They've stopped. Now they see us. They're running down the hill towards us, cried Ulrich. How many of them are there? asked George. I can't see distinctly, said Ulrich. Nine or ten. Then they are yours, said George. I only had seven with me. They are making all the speed they can, brave lads, said Ulrich gladly. Are they your men? asked George. Are they your men? he repeated impatiently as Ulrich did not answer. No, said Ulrich with a laugh, the idiotic chattering laugh of a man unstrung with hideous fear. Who are they? asked George quickly, straining his eyes to see what the other would gladly not have seen. Wolves! And now, Gabriel Ernest. 
There's a wild beast in your woods, said the artist Cunningham as he was being driven to the station. It was the only remark he had made during the drive, but as Van Cheel had talked incessantly, his companion's silence had not been noticeable. A stray fox or two and some resident weasels, nothing more formidable, said Van Cheel. The artist said nothing. What did you mean by a wild beast? said Van Cheel later, when they were on the platform. Nothing. My imagination. Here's the train, said Cunningham. That afternoon, Van Cheel went for one of his frequent rambles through his woodland property. He had a stuffed bittern in his study, and knew the names of quite a number of wildflowers, so his aunt had possibly some justification in describing him as a great naturalist. At any rate, he was a great walker. It was his custom to take mental notes of everything he saw during his walks, not so much for the purpose of assisting contemporary science as to providing topics for conversation afterwards. When the bluebells began to show themselves in flower, he made a point of informing everyone of the fact. The season of the year might have warned his hearers of the likelihood of such an occurrence, but at least they felt that he was being absolutely frank with them. What Van Cheel saw on this particular afternoon was, however, something far removed from his ordinary range of experience. On a shelf of smooth stone, overhanging a deep pool in the hollow of an oak coppice, a boy of about sixteen lay a sprawl, drying his wet brown limbs luxuriously in the sun. His wet hair, parted by a recent dive, lay close to his head, and his light brown eyes, so light that there was an almost tigerish gleam in them, were turned towards Van Cheel with a certain lazy watchfulness. It was an unexpected apparition, and Van Cheel found himself engaged in the novel process of thinking before he spoke. Where on earth could this wild-looking boy hail from? The miller's wife had lost a child some two months ago, supposed to have been swept away by the mill race— but that had been a mere baby, not a half-grown lad. "'What are you doing here?' he demanded. "'Obviously sunning myself,' replied the boy. "'Where do you live?' "'Here, in these woods.' "'You can't live in the woods,' said Van Cheel. "'They are very nice woods,' said the boy, with a touch of patronage in his voice. "'But where do you sleep at night?' I don't sleep at night. That's my busiest time. Van Cheel began to have an irritated feeling that he was grappling with a problem that was eluding him. What do you feed on? he asked. Flesh, said the boy, and he pronounced the word with slow relish, as though he were tasting it. Flesh? What flesh? Since it interests you, Rabbits, wildfowl, hares, poultry, lambs in their season, children when I can get any. They're usually too well locked in at night, when I do most of my hunting. It's quite two months since I tasted child flesh. Ignoring the chafing nature of the last remark, Van Cheel tried to draw the boy on the subject of possible poaching operations. You're talking rather through your hat when you speak of feeding on hares. Considering the nature of the boy's toilette, the smile was hardly an apt one. Our hillside hares aren't easily caught. At night, I hunt on four feet, was the somewhat cryptic response. I suppose you mean that you hunt with a dog, hazarded Van Cheel. The boy rolled slowly over onto his back and laughed a weird low laugh that was pleasantly like a chuckle and disagreeably like a snarl. I don't fancy any dog would be very anxious for my company, especially at night. Van Cheel began to feel that there was something positively uncanny about the strange-eyed, strange-tongued youngster. I can't have you stay in these woods, he declared authoritatively. I fancy you'd rather have me here than in your house, said the boy. The prospect of this wild, nude animal in Van Cheel's primly ordered house was certainly an alarming one. "'If you don't go, I shall have to make you,' said Van Cheel. 
the boy turned like a flash, plunged into the pool, and in a moment had flung his wet and glistening body halfway up the bank where Van Cheel was standing. In an otter the movement would have been remarkable. In a boy Van Cheel found it sufficiently startling. His foot slipped as he made an involuntary backward movement, and he found himself almost prostrate on the slippery weed-grown bank, with those tigery yellow eyes not very far from his own. Almost instinctively he half raised his hand to his throat. The boy laughed again, a laugh in which the snarl had nearly driven out the chuckle, and then, with another of his astonishing lightning movements, plunged out of view into the yielding tangle of weed and fern. "'What an extraordinary wild animal!' said Van Cheel as he picked himself up. And then he recalled Cunningham's remark. There's a wild beast in your woods. Walking slowly homeward, Van Cheel began to turn over in his mind various local occurrences which might be traced to the existence of this astonishing young savage. Something had been thinning the game in the woods lately, poultry had been missing from the farms, hares were growing unaccountably scarcer, and complaints had reached him of lambs being carried off bodily from the hills. Was it possible that this wild boy was really hunting the countryside, in company with some clever poacher dogs? He had spoken of hunting four-footed by night, but then again he had hinted strangely at no dog caring to come near him, especially at night. It was certainly puzzling. And then, as Van Cheel ran his mind over the various depredations that had been committed during the last month or two, he came suddenly to a dead stop alike in his walk and his speculations. The child missing from the mill two months ago. The accepted theory was that it had tumbled into the mill race and been swept away. But the mother had always declared she had heard a shriek on the hillside of the house, in the opposite direction from the water. It was unthinkable, of course, but he wished that the boy had not made that uncanny remark about child flesh eaten two months ago, such dreadful things should not be said even in fun. Van Cheel, contrary to his usual wont, did not feel disposed to be communicative about his discovery in the wood. His position as a parish councillor and justice of the peace seemed somehow compromised by the fact that he was harboring a personality of such doubtful repute on his property. There was even a possibility that a heavy bill of damages from raided lambs and poultry might be laid at his door. At dinner that night, he was quite unusually silent. "'Where's your voice gone to?' said his aunt. "'One would think you had seen a wolf!' Van Cheel, who was not familiar with the old saying, thought the remark rather foolish. If he had seen a wolf on his property, his tongue would have been extraordinarily busy with the subject." At breakfast next morning, Van Cheel was conscious that his feeling of uneasiness regarding yesterday's episode had not wholly disappeared, and he resolved to go by train to the neighboring cathedral town, hunt up Cunningham, and learn from him what he had really seen that had prompted the remark about a wild beast in the woods. With this resolution taken, his usual cheerfulness partially returned, and he hummed a bright little melody as he sauntered to the morning room for his customary cigarette. As he entered the room, the melody made way abruptly for a pious invocation. Gracefully sprawled on the ottoman, in an attitude of almost exaggerated repose, was the boy of the woods. He was drier than when Van Cheel had last seen him, but no other alteration was noticeable in his toilette. "'How dare you come here?' asked Van Cheel furiously. "'You told me not to stay in the woods,' said the boy calmly. "'But not to come here. Suppose my aunt should see you?' And with a view to minimizing that catastrophe, Van Cheel hastily obscured as much of his unwelcome guest as possible under the folds of a morning post. At that moment his aunt entered the room. "'This poor boy has lost his way and lost his memory. He doesn't know who he is or where he comes from,' explained Van Cheel desperately, glancing apprehensively at the waif's face to see whether he was going to add inconvenient candor to his other savage propensities. Miss Van Cheel was enormously interested. 
Oh, perhaps his underlinen is marked, she suggested. He seems to have lost that, too, said Van Cheel, making frantic little grabs at the morning post to keep it in its place. A naked, homeless child appealed to Miss Van Cheel as warmly as a stray kitten or derelict puppy would have done. We must do all we can for him, she decided, and in a very short time a messenger dispatched to the rectory where a page boy was kept had returned with a suit of pantry clothes and the necessary accessories of shirt, shoes, collar, etc. Clothed, cleaned, and groomed, the boy lost none of his uncanniness in Van Cheel's eyes, but his aunt found him sweet. We must call him something till we know who he really is she said. Gabriel Ernest, I think. Those are nice, suitable names. Van Cheel agreed, but he privately doubted whether they were being grafted on to a nice, suitable child. His misgivings were not diminished by the fact that his staid and elderly spaniel had bolted out of the house at the first incoming of the boy, and now obstinately remained shivering and yapping at the farther end of the orchard, while the canary, usually as vocally industrious as Van Cheel himself, had put itself on an allowance of frightened cheeps. More than ever he was resolved to consult Cunningham without loss of time. As he drove off to the station, his aunt was arranging that Gabriel Ernest should help her to entertain the infant members of her Sunday school class at tea that afternoon. Cunningham was not at first disposed to be communicative. My mother died of some brain trouble, he explained, so you will understand why I am averse to dwelling on anything of an impossibly fantastic nature that I may see or think that I have seen. But what did you see? persisted Van Cheel. What I thought I saw was something so extraordinary that no really sane man could dignify it with the credit of having actually happened. I was standing, the last evening I was with you, half hidden in the hedge growth by the orchard gate, watching the dying glow of the sunset. Suddenly I became aware of a naked boy, a bather from some neighborhood pool I took him to be, who was standing out on the bare hillside, also watching the sunset. His pose was so suggestive of some wild fawn of pagan myth that I instantly wanted to engage him as a model, and in another moment I think I should have hailed him. But just then the sun dipped out of view, and all the orange and pink slid out of the landscape, leaving it cold and grey. And at that same moment an astounding thing happened. The boy vanished too. What? "'Vanished away into nothing?' asked Cheel excitedly. "'No, that is the dreadful part of it,' answered the artist. "'On the open hillside where the boy had been standing a second ago "'stood a large wolf, blackish in colour, "'with gleaming fangs and cruel yellow eyes. "'You may think.' "'But Van Cheel did not stop for anything as futile as thought. "'Already he was tearing at top speed toward the station,' He dismissed the idea of a telegram. Gabriel Ernest is a werewolf, was a hopelessly inadequate effort at conveying the situation, and his aunt would think it was a code message to which he had omitted to give her the key. His one hope was that he might reach home before sundown. The cab, which he charted at the other end of the railway journey, bore him with what seemed exasperating slowness along the country roads, which were pink and mauve with the flush of the sinking sun. His aunt was putting away some unfinished jams and cake when he arrived. "'Where's Gabriel Ernest?' he almost screamed. "'He's taking the little toop child home,' said his aunt. "'It was getting so late, I thought it wasn't safe to let it go back alone. "'What a lovely sunset, isn't it?' But Van Cheel, although not oblivious of the glow in the western sky, did not stay to discuss its beauties— at a speed for which he was scarcely geared, he raced along the narrow lane that led to the home of the Toops. On one side ran the swift current of the mill stream, on the other rose the stretch of bare hillside. A dwindling rim of red sun showed still on the skyline, and the next turning must bring him in view of the ill-assorted couple he was pursuing. Then, 
the color went suddenly out of things, and a gray light settled itself with a quick shiver over the landscape. Van Chiu heard a shrill wail of fear and stopped running. Nothing was ever seen again of the Toop child or Gabriel Ernest, but the latter's discarded garments were found lying in the road, so it was assumed that the child had fallen into the water and that the boy had stripped and jumped in in a vain endeavor to save it. Van Cheel and some workmen, who were nearby at the time, testified to having heard a child scream loudly just near the spot where the clothes were found. Mrs. Toop, who had eleven other children, was decently resigned to her bereavement, but Miss Van Cheel sincerely mourned her lost foundling. It was on her initiative that the memorial brass was put in the parish church to Gabriel Ernest, an unknown boy, who bravely sacrificed his life for another. Van Cheel gave way to his aunt in most things, but he flatly refused to subscribe to the Gabriel Ernest Memorial. And now, The Open Window by H. H. Munro. "'My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall,' said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen. "'In the meantime, you must try and put up with me.' Frampton Nuttall endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much toward helping the nerve cure— which he was supposed to be undergoing. "'I know how it will be,' his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. "'You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nurse will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice.' Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sapleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. "'Do you know many of the people around here?' asked the niece, when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. "'Hardly a soul,' said Frampton. "'My sister was staying here, at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here.' He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. "'Then you know practically nothing about my aunt?' pursued the self-possessed young lady. Well, "'Only her name and address,' admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sapleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. "'Her great tragedy happened just three years ago.' said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow, in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of year, said Frampton. But has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe-shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day, they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out, 
her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm. And Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, where do you bound? As he always did to tease her. Because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes, on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has amused you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the window open, said Mrs. Sapleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess all over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds, and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, said Mrs. Sapleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea. Don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned toward the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close to their heels. Noiselessly they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the darkness, I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel driveway, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh, coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall, said Mrs. Sapleton, could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery, somewhere on the banks of the Ganges, by a pack of pariah dogs, and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave, with the creature snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance, at short notice, was her speciality. It seems we have quite a bit of time left, so I'd like to do one more story by Saki. This one was published in 1919, but it will certainly ring true with today's parents everywhere. And now, The Toys of Peace by H.H. H. Monroe. 
Harvey, said Eleanor Bope, handing her brother a cutting from a London morning paper of the 19th of March. Just read this about children's toys, please. It exactly carries out some of our ideas about influence and upbringing. In view of the National Peace Council, ran the extract, there are grave objections to presenting our boys with regiments of fighting men, batteries of guns, and squadrons of dreadnoughts. Boys, the council admits, naturally love fighting and all the panoply of war. But that is no reason for encouraging and perhaps giving permanent form to their primitive instincts. At the Children's Welfare Exhibition, which opens in Olympia in three weeks, the Peace Council will make an alternative suggestion to parents in the shape of an exhibition of peace toys. In front of a specially painted representation of the Peace Palace at The Hague will be grouped... Not miniature soldiers, but miniature civilians. Not guns, but plows and the tools of industry. It is hoped that the manufacturers may take a hint from the exhibit, which will bear fruit in the toy shops. Oh, the idea is certainly an interesting and very well-meaning one, said Harvey. Whether it would succeed well in practice... We must try, interrupted his sister. You are coming down to us at Easter, and you always bring the boys some toys, so that will be an excellent opportunity for you to inaugurate the new experiment. Go out in the shops and buy any little toys and models that have special bearing on civilian life in its more peaceful aspects. Of course, you must explain the toys to the children and interest them in the new idea. I regret to say the siege of Adrianople toy that their Aunt Susan sent them didn't need any explanation— they knew all the uniforms and flags and even the names of the respective commanders. And when I heard them one day, using what seemed to be the most objectionable language, they said it was Bulgarian words of command. Of course, it may have been, but at any rate, I took the toy away from them. Now, I shall expect your Easter gifts to give quite a new impulse and direction to the children's minds. Eric is not eleven yet, and Bertie is only nine and a half, so they are really at a most impressionable age. There is primitive instinct to be taken into consideration, you know, said Harvey doubtfully, and hereditary tendencies as well. One of their great uncles fought in the most intolerable fashion at Inkerman. He was specially mentioned in dispatches, I believe, and their great-grandfather smashed all his Whig neighbors' hothouses when the great reform bill was passed. Still, as you say... They are at an impressionable age. I will do my best. On Easter Saturday, Harvey Bope unpacked a large, promising-looking red cardboard box under the expectant eyes of his nephews. Your uncle has brought you the newest thing in toys, Eleanor had said impressively, and the youthful anticipation had been anxiously divided between Albanian soldiery and a Somali camel corps. Eric was hotly in favor of the latter contingency. There would be Arabs on horseback, he whispered. The Albanians have got jolly uniforms, and they fight all day long and all night, too, when there's a moon. But the country's rocky, so they've got no cavalry. A quantity of crinkly paper shavings was the first thing that met the view when the lid was removed. The most exciting toys always began like that. Harvey pushed back the top layer and drew forth a square, rather featureless building. "'It's a fort!' exclaimed Bertie. "'It isn't. It's the palace of the Emperor of Albany,' said Eric, immensely proud of his knowledge of the exotic title. "'It's got no windows, you see, so that passers-by can't fire at the royal family.' "'It's a municipal dustbin,' said Harvey hurriedly. You see, all the refuse and litter of a town is collected there, instead of lying about and injuring the health of the citizens. In an awful silence, he disinterred a little lead figure of a man in black clothes. That, he said, is a distinguished civilian, John Stuart Mill. He was an authority on political economy. Why? asked Bertie. Well, he wanted to be. He thought it was a useful thing to be. Bertie gave an expressive grunt, which conveyed his opinion that there was no accounting for taste. 
Another square building came out, this time with windows and chimneys. A model of the Manchester branch of the Young Women's Christian Association, said Harvey. Are there any lions? asked Eric, hopefully. He had been reading Roman history and thought that where you found Christians, you might reasonably expect to find a few lions. There are no lions, said Harvey. Here is another civilian, Robert Rakes, the founder of Sunday schools, and here is a model of a municipal wash house. These little round things are loaves baked in a sanitary bakehouse. That lead figure is a sanitary inspector. This one is a district councillor, and this one is an official of the local government board. What does he do? asked Eric wearily. He sees to things connected with his department, said Harvey. This box with a slit in it is a ballot box. Votes are put into it at election time. What is put into it at other times? asked Bertie. Nothing. And here are some tools of industry, a wheelbarrow and a hoe, and I think these are meant for hop holes. This is a model beehive, and that is a ventilator for ventilating sewers. This seems to be another municipal dustbin. No, no, it is a model of a school of art and public library. This little figure is Mrs. Hemans, a poetess, and this is Rowland Hill, who introduced the system of penny postage. This is Sir John Herschel, the eminent astrologer. Are we to play with these civilian figures? asked Eric. Of course, said Harvey. These are toys. They are meant to be played with. But how? It was rather a poser. You might make two of them contest a seat in Parliament, said Harvey, and have an election. With rotten eggs and free fights and ever so many broken heads, exclaimed Eric. And noses all bleeding and everybody drunk as can be, echoed Bertie, who had carefully studied one of Hogarth's pictures. Nothing of the kind, said Harvey. Nothing in the least like that. Votes will be put in the ballot box, and the mayor will count them, and he will say which has received the most votes, and then the two candidates will thank him for presiding, and each will say that the contest has been conducted throughout in the pleasantest and most straightforward fashion, and they part with expressions of mutual esteem. There's a jolly game for you boys to play. I never had such toys when I was young. I don't think we'll play with them just now, said Eric, with an entire absence of the enthusiasm that his uncle had shown. I think perhaps we ought to do a little of our holiday tasks. It's history time. We've got to learn up something about the Bourbon period in France. The Bourbon period? said Harvey, with some disapproval in his voice. We've got to know something about Louis the Fourteenth, continued Eric. I've learned the name of all the principal battles already. This would never do. There were, of course, some battles fought during his reign, said Harvey, but I fancy the accounts of them were much exaggerated. News was very unreliable in those days, and there were practically no war correspondents, so generals and commanders could magnify every little skirmish they engaged in till they reached the proportions of decisive battles. Louis was really famous now as a landscape gardener. The way he laid out Versailles was so much admired that it was copied all over Europe. Do you know anything about Madame Dubery? asked Eric. Didn't she have her head chopped off? She was another great lover of gardening, said Harvey evasively. In fact, I believe the well-known Rose Dubery was named after her. And now I think you had better play for a little and... Leave your lessons till later. Harvey retreated to the library and spent some thirty or forty minutes in wondering whether it would be possible to compile a history for use in elementary schools in which there should be no prominent mention of battles, massacres, murderous intrigues, and violent deaths. The York and Lancaster period and the Napoleonic era would, he admitted to himself, present considerable difficulties— and the Thirty Years' War would entail something of a gap if you left it out altogether. Still, it would be something gained if at a highly impressionable age children could be got to fix their attention on the invention of calico printing instead of the Spanish Armada or the Battle of Waterloo. 
It was time, he thought, to go back to the boy's room and see how they were getting on with their peace toys. As he stood outside the door, he could hear Eric's voice, raised in command. Bertie chimed in now and again with helpful suggestions. That is Louis the Fourteenth. Eric was saying. That one in knee breeches that Uncle said invented Sunday schools? It isn't a bit like him, but it'll have to do. We'll give him a purple coat from my paint box by and by, said Bertie. That is Madame de Maintenon, that one he called Mrs. Hemans. She begs Louis not to go on this expedition, but he turns a deaf ear. He takes Marshal Saxe with him, and we must pretend that they have thousands of men with them. The watchword is Kevi, and the answer is L'état c'est moi. That was one of his favorite remarks, you know. They land at Manchester in the dead of night, and a Jacobite conspirator gives him the keys of the fortress. Peeping in through the doorway, Harvey observed that the municipal dustbin had been pierced with holes to accommodate the muzzles of imaginary cannon, and now represented the principal fortified position in Manchester. John Stuart Mill had been dipped in red ink, and apparently stood for Marshal Saxe. Louis orders his troops to surround the Young Women's Christian Association and seize the lot of them. Once back at the Louvre, and the girls are mine, he exclaims. We must use Mrs. Hemans again for one of the girls. She says, never, and stabs Marshal Saxe to the heart. He bleeds dreadfully, exclaimed Bertie, splashing red ink liberally all over the facade of the association building. The soldiers rush in and avenge his death with the utmost savagery. A hundred girls are killed. Here, Bertie emptied the remainder of the red ink over the devoted building. And the surviving five hundred are dragged off to the French ships. I have lost my marshal, says Louis, but I do not go back empty-handed. Harvey stole away from the room and sought out his sister. Eleanor, he said. The experiment, yes, has failed. We have begun too late. And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed The Interlopers, Gabriel Ernest, and The Open Window by H. H. Monroe, also known as Saki. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is Not Your Mother's Storytime. <laughs>